Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today as we celebrate Black Philanthropy Month, the, all, all the way to the very end. This is the final day and we have a really um, poignant discussion around giving today. My name is Felicia Davis and I am president and CEO of Chicago Foundation for Women. Special thanks to our co-host, CFW Southside Giving Circle, who helped to spread the word, amplify our message with their networks. Black Philanthropy Month was created in 2011 by the African Women's Development Fund as an annual global celebration and, 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 and a concerted campaign to elevate giving by Africans and African Americans. In many cases, donors of color have been considered new and emerging. However, communities of color have been giving back to our communities for generations and generations in various ways. So well, this, is, um, this is a book that's very dear to me and it was given to me by members of the uh, CFW Southside Giving Circle. Um, so as the book Giving Back, a tribute to generations of African-American philanthropist shares, giving is part of family and cultural traditions that are often not reflected in traditional philanthropy. And I wanna share with you one of my favorite quotes in the book. And the book is by um, Valeda Fullwood. And one of my favorite quotes says, no building bears their names, no boardroom displays their portraits. And I always add, if you don't count a church basement, no foundation sustains their legacy. And yet the philanthropists best known to me are the ones in my family, my church, and um, my town. We're here on the south side of Chicago. Uh, so these people who um, demonstrate a profound love for humanity um, are part of a continuous chain of people of color, and in my case, African Americans with a, sh a strong tradition in giving back. Today's event will celebrate the unique approach to philanthropy by, black, by the black community and the reasons why people of color give and explore ways the sector can address misconceptions about black philanthropy. CFW, for our part, have been exploring this for some time. Last year, we partnered with BECOME, Center for Community Engagement and Social Change with the generous support of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation to conduct a formative evaluation to determine what gives philanthropic, what drives philanthropic giving and volunteerism among women and communities of color and how best to engage and expand, um, engage, expand and sustain giving on a more deeper level. We asked ourselves questions related to how we show up um, as an organization and as, as individuals in, that, in our organization, how we show up for our donors, our grantee organizations, and the communities we serve. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dominica McBride, founder and CEO of Become, a leading thinker on how we evolve beyond the current racial equity paradigm um, as a champion of culturally responsive evaluation and a grassroots advocacy strategist. Dr. McBride, Dr. McBride's work, um, and she will share a brief overview of why of the Why People Give report. Dr. McBride. Um, uh, as you, um, as Felicia uh, said, um, there are so many ways that uh, the Black community gives that are unrecognized um, and often unvoiced and, and overlooked. And so uh, in our journey together, uh, we sought out uh, to use philanthropy as a tool for community agency and to highlight the ways um, and the drivers of philanthropy in our communities. Um, and so in this evaluation, um, like we want to achieve with our own community empowerment, uh, we went through a community driven process, uh, starting with a visioning session, developing evaluation questions, um, community really drove um, uh, analysis um, and uh, partnered in, in um, collecting data uh, and in the overall report. And so nearly 600 people uh, were um, 
our 600 people participated in this evaluation. Uh, and we asked ourselves questions around um, what are the drivers of giving? Um, how should foundations and other uh, nonprofits like CFW uh, develop relationships with our community? Uh, and then what is the capacity that needs to be built to sustain that work? So a very diverse group of people participated uh, in, in this evaluation uh, from 20s to, to 20 years old to 90 years old. Oh, sorry, my punch. Uh, from, uh, um, from all over Chicagoland, different socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, and from, very much. Uh, and from uh, from the findings, uh, we learned uh, we learned a lot. And so I'm just going to give quick snippets uh, around some of the lessons, um, some of the lessons learned, some of uh, what we uncovered. Uh, and so, as you probably saw, that uh, about 50% of the people who took the survey uh, were of predominantly European descent, and then 50% were women of color. Um, and uh, one of the things that we recognized was that there's more diversity within groups than between groups. So some of the things that were similar, regardless of cultural background, is that what drives giving is relationships, that develop relationships uh, with us, genuine relationships, um, show appreciation, and demonstrate the impact uh, of a contribution. But there were some things that were distinctly different for women of color um, in this. Uh, those things centered around intersectionality, the importance of community, and that the organization reflects the community that it serves. So starting with intersectionality. Uh, so uh, intersectionality is basically like the over overlap of cultural identities. So here you talk about race, gender, sexuality, class, military status, sexual orientation. But a lot of times they're what is used to be compounded or to, to compound uh, the oppression that is experienced. Um, so for a quick example, um, I am an African-American woman, second generation Haitian, mother of two, live on the south side of Chicago, right? Another person might identify also as an African-American woman, but maybe a, is a veteran, um, originally from Mississippi, moved to Chicago. So the, you have a different combination of uh, of identities that affect people in different ways. And so here, when they're talking about driving identity, you're basically talking about see me for me, right? The women who are participating, see me for me and all that I bring um, and with my different priorities around my identity. Uh, so we have a couple examples of what women said uh, through the process, um, and one that I think is particularly hard hitting, um, this white women don't have to see intersectionality, we die if we don't. And this is a black woman saying, saying this, to conveying the importance um, of intersectionality for not only an organization to address it, but for ourselves as communities to, to see it. Also, like the priority of community. Um, so like the, the um, if not us, then who? Um, dynamic comes uh, came into play here. So when looking at the priorities of women of color um, and comparing it to, to white women or women of European descent, uh, this is what came out. So with women of color in general, education was to the top, race and ethnicity, then health. And this was around where they typically gave their time or their talent or their treasure. But it's important that to that we recognize that um, the giving to further the needs of a particular community came out really strong, significantly more strong, or specifically stronger in women of color in communities of color. And for African American women, particularly, race and ethnicity ranks the highest. So they gave or we give. Um, typically to initiatives, causes, programs that affect our community positively. In addition to that, um, here are some of the other significant differences between, uh, between groups. 
So people were um, more likely to give to family members over an organization, a friend over an organization, and a church or religious religious institution um, over another organization. And so talk about like the drivers of community and all of those things wrapped up in what community is. So thinking about the church or religious institution as part of the community, their family, friends as part of that community, but close community. So also reflecting the community. Um, I strongly believe that organizations should reflect the communities they serve from entry level to leadership. And so just this is related to the community piece, but another element around what the organization should look like uh, when, um, uh, when serving the community. And uh, lastly, uh, this is really what came out when uh, we talked about relationship building. Um, it's not only relationship building as far as person to person in donors, it's relationship building with the community. So listening, learning, educating, and responding. So listening to diverse donors, um, coming to the community, showing up um, in person. In, uh, and this was pre-COVID, um, but really like showing up however you, sh however you need to show up and however community is calling calling an organization to, to show up, to partner. Uh, and then offering opportunities um, for training, leadership, networking, but making sure it's a bi-directional relationship and responding to the needs and dreams of community. So that was it in a nutshell. There's, also, there's a lot more in the report. Um, the report is on CFW's website. There's both a, like a 70 plus page report and a five page if you have if you don't have the time to read the little book that was created out of this, um, but there's uh, so much, so much in there, and we recommend that that you jump in. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McBride. I wanted to um, do this over so that I do it properly for her. And so uh, Dominica, Dominica McBride is the founder and CEO of Become, and she's a leading thinker on how we evolve beyond the current racial equity paradigm. And she's a champion of culturally responsive evaluation and a grassroots advocacy strategist. Um, and her work centers on the belief that culturally responsive evaluation can be a tool for social justice, justice and thriving communities. I wanted to do, give her credit um, where credit was due and do it, uh, have a do-over on that part. Thank you so much, Dr. McBride, for uh, the insightful overview. Very welcome. Thanks, Felicia, for having me. Absolutely. Um, in a moment, you will hear more about a powerful philanthropist, the Reverend Willie Taplin Barrow, who embodied throughout her lifetime and now as her legacy, um, many of the preferences and priorities that surface in Dr. McBride's report. Indeed, if it was not for the foresight planning and steadfast commitment of, Re of Reverend Barrow, we would not have the Willie's Warriors Leadership Development Initiative at Chicago Foundation for Women today. This initiative elevates the leadership of Black women across the Chicago region, creating a pipeline and network of Black women leaders committed to equity and justice in Chicago. Warriors gain a better sense of themselves as leaders and develop skills related to systems change, economic empowerment, communications, and strategic alliances, while building a network among, among women, Black women leaders from diverse sectors and industries. Willie's Warriors honors and continues the legacy of the late Reverend Willie Taplin Barrow with support from Reverend Barrow's estate and partnership with the African American legacy at the Chicago Community Trust. Here to share more about the inspirational Reverend Willie Taplin Barrow is Dr. Patricia Carey, executor of the Barrow estate and goddaughter of Reverend Barrow. And she will um, talk a little bit about um, the exemplification of a commitment to education, community and activism throughout her career. Uh, Dr. Carey recently retired as the Associate Dean for Student Affairs and the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education and Human Development at New York University. Dr. Carey is a founder of the National Association of Black Women in Higher Education and served as its third national president as a member of the advisory board for Willie's Warriors Leadership Initiative, she ensures the vision of Reverend Barrow continues to live on throughout this effort. Help me in welcoming Dr. Patricia Carey. Dr. Carey. 
Thank you, Felicia, for inviting me to talk about Reverend Willie Taplin Barrow's philanthropic journey. Do you know, I love what Maya Angelou advised, make a mark on this world that can't be erased. And that's what Willie Taplin Barrow wanted to do and that's what she did during her lifetime and beyond. Reverend Barrow's lived experience became the focus of her philanthropy. And she left us with a legacy of purpose. She was a welder, that was her first job. And I can imagine her fusing steel together as passionately as she would come to do there as a welder of people through advocacy and activism. Whatever she committed to, she did wholeheartedly. She was tireless and relentless. And as a black woman leader in the civil rights movement in Chicago, fighting for equity and economic justice, she was determined to break down barriers and challenge the status quo she did. Willie was active in institutions that were male led. That was taken for granted. And she had to work hard, very hard to carve her way in, to claim her place for women's voices. She was just four feet 11. And at four feet 11, her loud, energetic and feisty voice made her very, very tall. She was referred to as the little warrior. The leadership of black women was critical to her. By nurturing that leadership together, we could make a lot of noise, good noise, individually and collectively. We could make a big difference, she said, make a deep imprint on our society. She saw black women and girls as a strong untapped army that when connected could and would change the world. Now, did she consider the 10% of her earning that she pledged to her church, like so many in the black religious community had historically done? Did she co consider that philanthropy? No, that was her tide. She was a preacher's daughter and herself a preacher. And that's just what the Bible taught, that kind of giving to support the ministry of the church. You know, Reverend Barrow was not born rich, but she was wealthy during her lifetime because she also invested in a legacy that she also wanted to leave. The nature of her bequests anticipated her vision of black women leading, coming into our own as leaders speaking with a loud voice, clear, passionate, and around the table wherever we found ourselves. She said, establish a leadership institute, a museum, a something that will provide opportunities for black women to become visionary leaders and activists that will nurture and empower new leadership and old and can encourage new ways of doing things that will be sustainable and everlasting. And so we did. And we knew that whatever that turned out to be, it had to be feisty and brave and bold and loud. So working with partners and Chicago Foundation for Women, we established the Willie Taplin Barrow Fund at CFW in 2018 to promote and support the leadership of black women and girls through Willie's Warriors our leadership development initiative and the Willie Taplin Barrow Emerging Leaders Annual Award. You know, both Willie's Warriors and the Emerging Leadership Award give voice to Reverend Barrow's wish to bring women together to support and learn from each other as an ever expanding circle of leaders building connections with others who also are working for just and inclusive society. After all, she said, we cannot make this journey by ourselves. So thank you, Willie Kaplan Barrow, the philanthropist who looks like no other.
Thank you, Felicia. Dr. Carey, thank you so much for sharing such a touching reflection of Reverend Barrow. This is really, and I will say this year's Emerging Leader Award, this isn't scripted, it was Christian Snow, who is the executive director of Asada's Daughters. And I know you enjoyed a really good conversation with, with Christian recently during CFW's annual Impact Awards, which were um, virtual this year. So thank you so much. Thank CFW you. is committed to ensuring women leaders have the support they need to succeed. The Woolies Warriors uh, Leadership Program is in its fourth year and has impacted the lives of 50 women leaders from diverse backgrounds and sectors and industries. Each program takes place over nine months where the warriors gain a better sense of themselves as leaders while building the close knit network um, with their sister warriors. I actually just love that, 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 that title uh, warriors. Um, or that moniker, sister warriors. Willie's Warriors is supported by the Barrow Fund, which supports initiatives to invest in Black women and girls in the Chicago region to give rise to the new models of collaborative work and leadership centered around women of color and to ensure generations of new leaders understand and appreciate the legacy of Reverend Willie Taplin and Barrow. Women's leadership is vital to the continued success of our communities, especially for Black women leaders and Black communities. But the Black women leaders often find themselves all too often um, as Chandra Rhymes um, refers to as first, only, or different, FOD. Thank you so much to those of you who have already made a gift to support today's event. If you haven't already, I'm asking you to consider making a contribution now. All funds raised today will support Woolies Warriors Leadership Initiative, ensuring that Reverend uh, Barrow's legacy and vision lives on for decades to come. Making a gift is super easy. You take out your phone, um, and I'm going to do it as I as I walk through this myself. You take out your phone, and you will text CFW to the number two four three seven two five and make a gift, and it should be on your screen. So, you text to the number two four three seven two five, and you text CFW, and you will get a, a pop up message that says, "Thank you for supporting." Um, with a special link to donate to support Willie's Warriors. So I do hope that you take a moment to do that and to join me, um, Dr. Carey, um, and many, many others in continuing the legacy of Reverend Willow Barrow. So I'm pausing just for a little bit because I hear those, I can kind of hear in the air that those things are um, happening. All right. So thank you again for your continued support of CFW and our Willie's Warriors program. Now let's continue the conversation. And to do that, I'd like to introduce our remaining panelists. Akira Barclay is a consultant and founder of Fresh Philanthropy. She's a dynamic philanthropy professional leveraging 20 years of experience in grant making, fundraising, strategic partnerships, media, and marketing to inform her work with donors. She is also co-chair of Chicago Foundation for Women's Southside Giving Circle. So Akira will join us. I'd also like to introduce Sharon Bush. Sharon is the executive director of the Grand Victoria Foundation. She's a recognized leader in the field with over 20 years of experience, focused on ensuring the sector is strong, equitable, sustainable, and highly capable of serving individuals and families throughout the Chicago region. Sharon is on the board of directors for AbbVie, a national philanthropic organization that advocates for responsive and transformative investments in black communities and African-American legacy at the Chicago Community Trust. She is an advisor um, to the Willie's Warriors Leadership Initiative at CFW, a leadership development, um, I already said that, sorry, um, and, um, and she generally um, supports uh, black women. And last but not least, allow me to introduce Jessica Dutley, Associate Director of Arabella Advisors and Director of Chicago African Americans in Philanthropy or CAPE. Through these roles, she supports foundations and nonprofits um, committed to dismantling racism, sexism, and other forms of oppression to develop strategi strategies that enhance the impact of their efforts. Throughout her career, she has directed, developed, and implemented community-based prevention and outreach programs related to gun violence and addressing health disparities. 
Jessica is a founding member of Chicago, of CFW's Southside Giving Circle. And I am excited to welcome them all to this conversation. So we have, uh, we're on time, so we're gonna be able to hopefully get in a lot of great questions. So I'll start with this question. The term philanthropy is often used to mean large financial gifts given by wealthy individuals to organizations, institutions, or individuals in need. And I often say this, the image that people um, evoke or evokes in people's mind when you say philanthropist is really the short um, fat white guy with the glasses on the monopoly box. That's what people think about as, uh, as a philanthropist. So however, the philanthropic culture of African-American giving is unique. And you've heard some of that already today from Dominica's or Dr. McBride's presentation. When you think of your philanthropic experiences, how do they differ um, from the traditional definition of philanthropy? And I will start with Akira, um, or Akira, can you start? And then anyone else can join in as you see fit. Absolutely. So that description um, I usually meet with most philanthropists are not billionaires. And so I think that uh, it does us all a disservice when we do get the image of the little guy from Monopoly um, and the real time modern version, you know, our sort of tech moguls and the images that we see. Um, because the reality is uh, philanthropists come in all shapes, sizes and colors. And it is sort of the everyday givers that are the ones that keep the nonprofit organizations in our country in particular going from day to day. So um, my experiences with philanthropy, of course, like lots of black people go all the way back to my childhood um, and watching grandparents who were highly involved in their church um, giving in every kind of way possible from tithing like Willie Barrow to missionary work with making sure that anyone in our community that was in need um, had that need tended to. Um, and then by the time I became an adult, I realized that there was this entire um, field of work that could be done um, and it was called philanthropy. So I started out as a social worker and through that, understanding where the funding came from, for the agencies that I was working for, that led me um, to the field of philanthropy. So um, my experiences, you know, it's sort of, it's eye-opening to understand that what I experienced my entire life, now there's, there's sort of giving a different name to it. But I think that philanthropy um, particularly in African American communities is very recognizable if we sort of push aside this sort of monopoly guy image of it and really think about the people um, who are closest to us and the work that is being done all around us. Thanks, Akira. Jessica, what about you? I know when we first started talking about this conversation, you would share that you were going to be um, uh, on radio talking about this very this very topic. So when you think about philanthrop your philanthropic experiences, how do they differ from the traditional definition of philanthropy, Jessica? Yeah, so I think very similar to Akira and other folks who are joining us today, a lot of what I learned about philanthropy started with my own family and started with a deep sense of connection to service. And so from a very young age, I was volunteering alongside my parents um, and understood that there was a commitment and a responsibility to be engaged in that type of service and didn't understand that there was a formal system for that. Similarly, until I was at a nonprofit and had needed to do some fundraising. And so really started to understand that there's an incredible um, organized um, and very opaque system behind that work that few people have access to understanding. Um, and I think the challenge in that is that it, what it does is it really forces people to feel like they are outside of that, that they are different from that formal system. And so the giving and the philanthropy that most African Americans are engaged in um, is seen as separate from that and different from that system of formal philanthropy that gets so much credit and so much awe. And I think 
think it leaves people not realizing how much giving happens in the community. I know that in Dr. McBride's research and Akira's research, other folks' research, there's always the conversation about the fact that African-American households actually give 25% more than the national average. Um, but because that does stay very local, because it stays inside of their churches, because those are the sources of community support and giving, because that stays within families as folks really help out support and continue to create thriving communities. It's not acknowledged in the same way that the more traditional philanthropy sector is. Jessica, thank you so much. I think that that statistic needs repeating because it's really it's really important. So can you say that again, African-American or black families give 25 mm -hmm. Black families in the United States give 25% more than the national average. So really are invested in philanthropy, are giving significant amounts of money. Um, it's just showing up in different spaces than sort of the, the name recognition that you mentioned in the quote earlier. Thank you so much. Um, Sharon, I'm going to come to you next because I think it's really important the context that's been set already. Um, how has history shaped the way that African-Americans give? Oh, I thought I was going to get to answer the other question. You can. You can do both, though. You can answer right, I'll try to. I'll try to weave them together because I think I want to build on something which Jessica just said, which is um, how what, what we do is not recognized. And that contributes, that could be a result of um, historic othering, like these things that we do all the time, um, like they matter, they're compounded, um, there's impact. Um, but when we're also treated very differently and we're other than these ways, the things that we do also like have a different name or don't have a name at all, right? So that's one thing. Um, I also too come from a very, um, as a kid, uh, we grew up in an apartment building and my mom was, um, so for some of the time um, with the five of us um, on her own, but what we saw like within our building was more like mutual aid. Like we would go and go next door and borrow a cup of sugar, a cup of flour, <laughs> right? Um, when we needed to have those things. The person who was our landlord then was really a person who was a caregiver and a watcher over my mother um, to make sure that my mother had what she needed to do to take care of her five children. And my mother was a young mother. So all of those things are ways of giving. And then I'll just talk a little bit more personally about my own experiences, some similar to what was described, but um, also very much aligned with what Dominica's report um, said, which is um, like what I've personally given to are things that really um, uplift and support the agency of black people and black communities. Like that's a very personal thing. And that's very different than what traditional or conventional philanthropy does. We just saw a report that came out um, last week on um, how community foundations are not giving um, to black um, causes. And so like I've given to education, I've given to politics and democracy issues to make sure that there's voice in that way. Um, also other groups that really lend themselves to giving community voice and economic empowerment are things which I've personally given to um, I think the other thing we don't talk so much about or we talk about it in a different context is the amount of time that we give. Um, and we do that in very intentional ways. And so I know like the work that I've done, um, you wouldn't necessarily categorize it as philanthropy, but it's lots of time that's spent on relationship building with other black women, lots of time on structuring and being very deliberate around structuring the networks that we can put together mentoring, sponsoring, bridge building to make sure that people have access to resources and organized philanthropy. All of that is like a contribution of time, but it's very deliberate around these goals of agency, empowerment, and voice. So um, agree like about not being super transactional, about really being relation um, oriented. And I would just say like, I'm not a historian, Felicia, but I think, um, Part of what you see like in these trends around the, the issue areas that um, black people give to education, racial equity, health, um, uh, economic services were the things that were um, mentioned in her report. Like those are all the huge like system challenges that we face as a people. Um, that really shape why we give to those particular, why those would rise up to the level of priority that we would give. So 
Um, we're seeing that in much different ways now in terms of what the current movement looks like, but um, how we've been treated, how we've been othered, um, all of those things historically really contribute and shape those trends that Dominica saw. So we all know that stuff. Um, we see it all the time. Um, and then, you know, it's nice for us to see that on paper so that other people can see it. And I, I know that that could contribute more and we might get to this later about what could change in the sector. Yeah, yeah. Sharon, thank you. Thank you so much for that. It makes me think about um, even my, you know, growing up the way that I was raised, similar to what you all have already shared, this kind of responsibility. My mother, my grandmother instilled in me this, this collective responsibility. And it makes me think about the, um, African pro are saying that goes, I am because we are, and we are because, you know, therefore, because I am, and that, that we are constantly interconnected. Um, it's also something that I think Reverend Barrel said um, um, often and has a pointed um, essay or sermon because she probably would have substituted it for both at different points. Um, Dr. Carey, is there anything you'd like to add here as well? Uh, in terms of philanthropy? Yes. You know, um, I think marching is a is a, a a kind of philanthropy, and I used to march a lot, but now that I'm just a little tiny bit older, this is the way I march. I march by giving to the causes and institutions that I care about. Um, I give to my church. Uh, I tithe, or I call it a pledge, uh, and I support the 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 mission of my church in many different ways. Uh, I give through trustee board membership on nonprofit boards. And we know that that carries, you know, a price tag. And I also give through institutional memberships, which include um, arts uh, institutions, institutions that focus on black culture, uh, on political uh, activism. So we don't uh, you know, as, as uh, one of our colleagues has, has said, we don't always name these philanthropy, but they really are. Do you know? It's, it's giving. Mm -hmm. And it's giving, um, saying that, oh, by the grace of God, go I. Mm -hmm. Or reaching back and saying, I've got to pull people along. And this is the way I can pull them along. Mm -hmm. I could go on and on, but let me stop. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Carey, thank you so much. Um, what's been reflected so far makes me think about the title of the report um, that Dr. McBride just shared. It's Time, Talent, and Treasure. And so it's the giving of all of those things um, simultaneously and, and at different points and the ways in which Black people and African Americans have showed up to support community and that relationship. Um, um, you know, one of our colleagues, I think it was Sharon, um, possibly, or Jessica, who pointed out the fact that the things that um, African Americans traditionally have given to are those systems that are not invested in by others. So the political process, education, um, those types of things. And so when you think about that expanded definition, um, Dr. McBride, um, you're still with us. Can you talk a little bit more about how that time, talent, and treasure really shows up in philanthropy for us? Yeah, in, in many of the ways that uh, my my brilliant fellow colleagues have mentioned, uh, and uh, I just want to note too when we talk about systems, uh, there's both like the former formal systems that have already been established, the healthcare system, the education system that we want to shape to to actually work for us. But then there's these informal systems that we've been talking about, the ways that we give to each other to to make life work. In, in this very distorted reality that we live in. Uh, and so in making life work for us, like making sure that we celebrate that holistic uh, way, way and systems that we have naturally developed for us and then begin to build on those systems, especially now during like given COVID, given, given drastic changes to those systems and, and in our community, that we really need to celebrate how we have taken care of each other and how we are taking care of each other and build on that so that we can make sure that none, that, that continue to make sure and, um, and, and even increase 
uh, the efforts that we're doing to make sure that none of our neighbors, none of our, our friends, our, our family, extended family, church family, uh, fall through the cracks. Um, and so uh, in, in celebrating what we do, how we do it, how we have given our philanthropy and how it is a system in and of itself, then we can build those things that work for us and not necessarily rely so much on what has been created around us that is not serving us. Thank you so much. So I'm going to refer back to this book again, Giving Back, because what I love about it is that it's, it's replete with stories about um, people with modest means who at their, um, you know, through their giving or upon their deaths in some instances have provided scholarships, have bestowed um, endowed institutions, um, washerwomen, um, you know, everyday mailmen, postmen, everyday um, black Americans have done this through their philanthropy. And one of the things that, um, um, that I think we all, um, you know, in our pre-conversation were struck by is how infrequently African-Americans are asked to give. Um, I've often said that there is this feeling, I think, um, this common belief that communities that are, have great challenges, so uh, communities with great challenges, in our case, if African-American communities have been underinvested in, have been marginalized in some instance, then there's this other side that people think that those communities aren't also communities with great resources, either knowledge resources or financial resources, and that's a shame. So recognition of Black philanthropy is really uh, um, vital in the nonprofit sector. There currently exists within the African-American community a greater accumulation of wealth than ever before. Why are African Americans approached far less often than their white counterparts to volunteer in non-Black organizations and to give to those same organizations? And what needs to change within the nonprofit sector? So I see Akira, would you like to go first? I got <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> I get asked this question a lot, of course. Um, and I think that one of the key things um, to think about is um, who is wealthy and how you define that wealth. Um, I think a lot of times black people aren't asked because someone somewhere along the line made the assumption that we just didn't have it to give. Um, and I think also there is um, a lot of what uh, fundraising and development is based on is uh, sort of the precedence of giving in other places. And so with our giving looking like it does um, and not always showing up in these uh, very rigid ways that others give, a lot of our generosity gets overlooked or um, minimized to an extent um, in a way that makes a, a potential donor um, maybe not show up as someone who would be a good person to engage. And so I think that that's one. And then I think there's also um, maybe a lack of presence in communities where these uh, potential black donors are. So, um, you know, so much of this comes through relationships as we discussed in the beginning. Um, if you're not building relationships with black people you know, who are you gonna ask? You know, <laughs> so it's a, I, I don't want to oversimplify it, but I do want to emphasize that a lot of it is simple. It's as simple as who are you talking to? Um, where, are the, where are the places that you are doing your networking activities? Um, and who are you learning from? You know, if you're only relying on, um, you know, wealth managers from a particular bank or um, someone who is a member of, you know, an association or, um, you know, something like that, where it's really uh, a person to person or peer to peer, um, then you're going to miss a lot of Black people who could be potential supporters of your cause. Yeah. De Jessica and Sharon, because you both can speak uh, individually and then also I think expansively with the um, organizations, the national organizations that you're both a part of. So Sharon, you're already chomping at the bit, so go ahead. I, because what Akira said is like so dead on, but I guess I would put a finer point on it and call it 
like it is structural. So it's simple and complex at the same time because it's structurally, this is like we do our work in a white dominant frame. All of what she said like goes into that frame, right? So like who are the networks? Who's considered wealthy? What does wealth mean? What does it look like? Um, and we structure our organizations accordingly around that, right? So I remember coming into the field um, 15 years, however many years ago, and all I saw were white fundraising professionals. You never ever saw a person of color who was hired to do the fundraising, right? Um, we think about the fundraising as these big gifts to universities and not to other places where you can get like, you can aggregate these other funds in these ways to fund groups. We have these networks of influence in the way that Akira just described that are white dominated because that is what is valued. Um, we have a historic lack of funding for racial justice issues because we have white leaders who are CEOs or um, and dominate boards and they put the framework on the organization and don't fund those kinds of issues. They get underfunded and that's, those are the things that we care about and that we typically are drawn to. So it is a, it's systemic, it is a structural issue um, in order to unwind from that, like we would really have to take on Dominica's, I love her cultural humility lens, because if we decided to adopt that, we really would structure our organizations much differently in order to like take that framework on. And the people who are in different positions, they might look different, they might not, they might take on different mindsets, right, around how do we engage, what do we engage, and when. So, um, I think what could change is like just what we're doing, like better um, education about like the patterns of black giving and priorities and how we actually define what that means for us. I think um, more advocacy around closing the racial wealth gap, actually, if everybody like paid attention to that, that is good for everyone. I was with my dad yesterday and we were in the grocery store and he said to me at the end of the trip, can you imagine how prosperous this whole country would be if we just figured out how to dedicate resources to lifting up what we do and what our wealth is, and how that would be great for everyone. And if you think about that in a fundraising context, um, that would be amazing. So I'll let Jessica go on, but I could go on and on about this. <laughs> yeah, I think similarly to, to what um, both Sharon and Akira have said, so much of this system is set up to be donor centric and a very specific type of donor. And so we see that reflected both in who's asked to be a part of things, but also what is asked of nonprofits and folks who are going to be the end users of philanthropy, um, that they are really asked to cater to the needs of donors rather than and catering to the needs of their communities in the way that they're even doing their fundraising and outreach efforts. And so it's just served to reinforce a system that is not, and it was never intended um, to serve communities and those end users of philanthropic dollars. And so I think we see just at many, many levels that being reinforced. Um, I want to pick up something that Akira said earlier about wealth managers, because for so many folks, their entry point as individuals, particularly high wealth individuals, is through um, um, their fund managers, through folks who are advising them to do this work. And if folks don't have access to that advice, don't have access to those formal systems, then they're missing out on a whole suite of opportunities to have their giving elevated in the way that we have sort of qualified as um, as traditional or as necessary to be acknowledged for the work that you're doing. And so I think just top to bottom, sort of it's a system that reinforces itself and reinforces that white dominance that continues to other African-Americans and black people, people of color and the ways that they give and the ways that they want to are enabled to support their own communities. Yeah, I, um, Dr. Harry, I mean, what Jessica and Akira and Sharon have just said um, and I'm asking you this because you're a little senior, more senior than we are. And I want to, and this is an important, I think, historical frame. Um, we started off talking about all of the ways in which um, 
um, African Americans traditionally start off with that 10% tithing frame, um, and their giving being centered around the, the their local church, which is really a centering of community because commun churches, in, in many instances, um, in an informal and sometimes formal way, serve as that community center. There are a lot of things happening at churches that don't have anything to do with you know proselytizing about a particular religion, food programs, um, after school programs, tutoring. And, and, and historically literacy, actually teaching people to read, teaching blacks to read when it was illegal and lots of other um, um, examples. Um, huge social justice movements, civil rights movements were piggybacked on the structures that were already in place. Dr. Carey, can you provide a little bit more uh, context to that kind of historical frame? Uh, well, the church was really uh, the institution that, that we welcomed us do you know, uh, from the very, very beginning, I mean, what did we have? Uh, we, you know, and I'm going way, way back before I was even born uh, to that one, uh, one house, uh, you know, school, um, and then the church, I mean, uh, such a reliance on, on hope through God. Uh, and the black community then um, be began uh, to to contribute to the church because the church was the community and the church was, as, as you're saying, um, offered so many more services as it evolved. Um, it was not a new thing, but you know, if you, if you read the Bible, uh, you know, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, uh, and, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments and all of that, all of those institutions can be subsumed within those Ten Commandments. So it's, it's the food pantries that we now have. It's, it's the clothing closets that we have. It's, it's political activism. Um, uh, it's it's uh, taking care of each other. Uh, and so uh, the church is doing what it has always done. And the, the monies then, um, you know, go to that mission. So when I say I pledge my monies to the mission of the church, the mission is indeed the encompassing of all, of all that it does now, reaching out to a broader community and while churches are supposed to be non-political, I don't think churches can be non-political. I mean, everything <laughs> is political, right? Um, and, you know, they, they're not supposed to come out for any one candidate, but they can guide, they can guide according to their, to their mission. Um, and so I don't know if I've, you know, answered poignantly the, the, that question, but, uh, when we talk about uh, philanthropy and, and uh, deciding who can give, church folks have already, always given, and they don't look like philanthropists. You know, they aren't that little roly-poly man <laughs> with, with endless amounts of money. Um, you know, to, to the points that have been made, uh, people have been typecast. We've been stereotyped. Uh, and so there's a real reluctance to ask that person down the street, oh, could you give $5? I mean, surprise, that person might give you 5,000, but because we have so pigeonholed uh, hold people, um, we've missed out. Um, yeah, yeah. That's a really good point. So we have a question from the um, someone watching, um, tuning in today, Laura Jansen. So her question was, how do we get people to give beyond their church? So many community needs are beyond what churches can provide. And I'll start off by saying a lot of the, what was in the research and the report um, that Dr. McBride presented to us today is around 
um, the relationships and being asked. Every woman here on the panel today has spoken about not being asked to give. Um, we've um, understand that a lot of the nonprofit structures, I think it was either Jessica or Sharon um, who pointed out that the way that things were structured were really to center white giving and white philanthropy. And so in organizations, I think it's building relationships with people and communities. And sometimes that looks like, I said this recently at a, a, a fundraising, um, a, a, a conference for fundraising professionals. Every fundraising um, professional is, is evaluated by how much, how many dollars, or an organization is evaluated how much dollars, how many dollars they're bringing in the door. And I asked the question, how many are you are tracking what type of community events that you're doing? Because those community outreach events as well, um, Laura, can help you it, what came across, and I think everyone um, repeated it, is that you have to be present in the community. They have to see you as a trusted voice. They have to see you as a trusted partner in order to um, um, work with your organization and be willing to give. Um, so I'm going to uh, combine a couple of questions because this really speaks to how the nonprofit sector and, found, and philanthropy overall needs to change. So Lauren Birchlove um, and Sharita Ellens have and, and uh, Alexandra Perez Garcia have a couple of questions that are kind of like the same. And it, it's, it's how do we um, promote more women, black women into leadership roles and development? How can we promote it as a viable career um, opportunity for black women? And Alexandra adds, um, given the thread of what's happening, how can women of color, black and Latinx who are um, interested and actively pursuing fundraising roles in development. What advice would we give? So let's combine those two questions and um, anyone who wants to start. I'll start um, because in my former life, I was a development officer. Um, I served as director of development for a number of smaller organizations. And I mean, naturally I was a younger person then, um, but there will come a point in a black development officer's career where uh, this uh, donor centric nature of the work that Jessica spoke of um, comes into conflict with that black person's um, career trajectory. So I will give a very personal example without naming the names of an organization, but I've had three um, in the 11 and a half years that I worked in development, I had three instances where in an interview scenario, someone says to me, you would be amazing. I know you can do the work. Our donors will not receive it from you. Mm -hmm. um, in another situation, Putting Meaning that, you, that the white donors want someone who looks like them asking well, the them. The donor base was older, okay. um, white, and I mean, no matter what the donor base looked like, that institutional leader knew, sitting across the table from me, that the response from their current donor base would not be a positive one. So mm -hmm. no matter how talented I was, no matter how convincing I was. So that's that. And that's, that's not on the professional, that's on the institution to figure out. Yeah. Um, and then um, I wanna go back to Dr. Carey and one of the ways that she says she gives as a trustee in the leadership role of nonprofit organizations, that is key because boards work hand in hand, well, they should work hand in hand with the fundraisers and development officers in an organization. Um, and so in this role, board development is something um, that's done, put together, you know, this board retreat, we're gonna learn things, we're gonna, we're gonna ramp up our giving only to have my executive director tell me that the board members really needed to hear it from a white man in a tie. So I don't want the burden of figuring out how to excel in a development career to fall on this, the black person when so much of what limits a black development officer's career is the systems mm -hmm. that are built 
to favor a very narrow segment mm -hmm. of the donor community. Mm -hmm. Akira, thank you. So we only have a, a couple of minutes. Sharon, um, do you want to add anything? Or Jessica, as we close today, um, um, building off of what Akira has just said and advice for the young professionals. Um, it's hard to follow what Akira just said because it's so um, profoundly true. I also think there are just things you can just affirm too. I did have an opportunity to help um, promote an African-American into a high ranking development job in a really fabulous um, grantee organization. And I had known her and watched her for years and I knew like she could do the job. I knew she could do the job. But with all the things that Akira said, it would mean that they would have to structure her support very deliberately to make sure she was set up to succeed, right? So we get to share those experiences with other people too, to give people coaching on what it means to change your cultural environment, to do the things that Akira talked about. So all of this kind of talk around short-term outcomes of like who can like secure the grant, the $50,000 grant versus stuff that we're good at, which is developing relationships and how that is like a marker around what longer term success is so that we don't do that work and have somebody come in behind us and reap the benefits of all of that, right? Yeah. Because that's yeah. how like we set up these measures around success. So we can do lots of things that are affirming and structural um, to address Akira's comments. Sharon, thank you so much. It's going to have to be the last word. I know we can talk another three hours on this topic alone and you guys will educate us, could educate us even further. But I do want to say, Dr. Carey, thank you. Dr. McBride, thank you. Akira, Jessica, and Sharon, thank you all so much. The Southside Giving Circle, shout out to you for co-hosting um, this, uh, co-sponsoring this event for us today. The audience, thank you for joining us on the last day celebrating Black Philanthropy Month on a Monday afternoon. Give yourself a round of applause. CFW's work is centered on changing the narrative around philanthropy and what it means to be a philanthropist. I hope today's event, and we are also on our own journey for to, to, to structure a more cultural um, humility frame. And I hope today's event has inspired you to think differently about philanthropy, your own philanthropy, and encourages you to exercise your giving in different ways, just as we shared through the conversation today. Marginalized communities and communities of color are often overlooked by, by the philanthropic sector. Donors are overlooked and not asked, but just as we learned today, they have tremendous value. All we have to do is look, listen, lead with humility, and connect on a deeper level. We are living in unprecedented times, and the needs across our communities continue to grow. So please continue to do what you can to take care of yourself and to take care of others. Wear your mask, please, and wash your hands. Thank you, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all so very much. Thank you.